Okay, hello everybody. It's an honor to speak to you at the Applied Machine Learning Days in the track of AI and leadership. <laughs> what I wanna do for the next 15 minutes, hopefully, is to give you insights on our most recent research project on which we labeled Big Data or Big Brother in Swiss companies, how datafication technologies affect employees in the workplace and what are the implications of these novel technologies, also for leadership and HR control practices. As you might have guessed from the title, the baseline assumption for this talk is that due to the advent of artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms, the employee buy-in in the, in the implementation of these new technologies is critical for the success inside the organization. This is the baseline assumption we take. This is what we know from previous research, for instance, on electronic performance monitoring, uh, monitoring which is a decade-spanning field of research, and which becomes even more relevant when we talk about self-learning algorithms or reinforcement algorithms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is a tiny little snapshot on the state of the art applications AI, take, oh, how AI algorithms involve in how agent management control is executed. For instance, you probably all know Slack somehow, right? You have interacted with it and this, for instance, analyzes constantly your reading habits and proposes, for instance, certain content which might apply to your, to your, um, to your likes or dislikes and sort of puts it right to read and easy to grasp. This, uh, for instance, IBM phase recognition algorithms by Watson. Las Vegas casinos use these kind of um, phase recognition algorithms for their performance management because they agreed on that if card dealers don't smile enough, people do not spend enough money on the table. And if card dealers don't smile enough, and this is measured via the phase recognition algorithm, they get fired or they get lowered their bonus. Hiring robots, I don't need to talk about hiring robots. In this particular setting, they're measuring hand sweat, they're measuring tonality, for instance, of a job candidate during the interview and infer if somebody's really capable of performing the job or if he or she will belong to the high potentials and ready for promotion programs. And this is something which struck me most during uh, my time doing research smart toilets in Japan analyzing instantly the urine of employees using this toilet in order to infer promotability, for instance. This all happens. So you see, there's a huge variety in terms of how technology, AI, and ML algorithms may involve into the way HR management is executed at the workplace, of course, at varying degrees of maturity, but, and this took me one and a half year of my PhD thesis, uh, there's a lack of conceptual approach to describe and to cite Peter Drucker to ultimately manage these novel phenomena in the workplace. And I think we all agree in this room, even if you're an, a non-social science guy, we need to understand this, especially from a leadership perspective in order to manage this well for the good of the business and for the good of the employees at the same time. So this is basically the credo I'm following. And this is the research project on we are doing. Um, and this is the three-step approach we, we undertook. First is describing. This is what research always wants to do at the very beginning of a project. Set in the baseline, set in definitions. What are we talking about when we use the term, for instance, people analytics or HR analytics or HR metrics? And what makes, for instance, this hiring robot, what does the hiring robot has in common with the facial, facial, facial recognition algorithm and what or, or why is this robot different from the smart toilet or the, fa uh, the, the fatigue management app or even Google Oxygen. So this is the basic approach. And then afterwards, of course, we'll modeling, say how do datafication controls affect employee trust in the employer? As I said, this belongs to the baseline assumption, right? If people do not trust their employer, they will start gaming or faking these systems. And as we all know from business practice, the criminal logic, so to speak, of employers is always one step ahead of the compliance network uh, companies want to implement. Questions? No? And finally, also we derive some normative statements and this is what I want to throw into for discussion. What are the implications of AI for leadership? What are the implications of AI and ML algorithms for future HR control management, what are ethical dilemmas, and how can leaders prevent these abuses. Okay, let's go inside. This is the first endeavor, as I already said, what is 
it about when we're talking about people analytics. And it took us, as I said, almost one and a half years in order to get our heads around what we were really talking about when meaning people analytics. And so what we did is we engaged in a morphological analysis, which is a method stemming from the 1960s rocket science, really. Uh, nowadays, you'd label it inventive engineering. So we talked to lots of people from various perspectives, scientists, scholars. We were talking to developers, to tech guys, to coders to consultants, to users, to full, full runner user companies in order to get a harmonized understanding of what are we talking about. And um, as I'll present this framework right in a second, the value added for leadership is that we first will be able or we offer a solution to describe and identify what's going on in the organization. Due to the fact that we were able to describe what we see, we were able to, that's what the business guys would call a benchmarking, right? And um, how do we, where do we stand? Are we forerunner? Are we a leader or are we a lagger? And of course, road mapping in terms of what are do's and don'ts maybe. Where do I have to invest more money? Where do I invest to have more resources? Where, where does the, the journey of HR analytics or people analytics go in my company? Where am I willing to invest? How much value do I attach to, to the consideration of ethical dilemmas, for instance, or regulatory issues, right? And this is the framework, and I don't want to spend too much time because you can read it anyways, but the thing is, two things stand out from this uh, framework. The first is that the claim that technology makes processes, organizational processes more efficient does not necessarily hold for organizational practice because as we can see, the leadership task or the management task becomes more complex. Because technology, so the advent of technology makes it more complex in order to effectively manage people in the workplace. This is the first. And the second, and this stems from the, from our study of previous literature and anecdotal evidence from our um, uh, theory building case studies, that there are do's, there are don'ts, and there is, it depends on with regards to the employee experience, to a vivid trust culture, to employees trust in the employer. So you can use this tool, for instance, in terms of just connecting these boxes from the top to the bottom, and then you can easily see, and ultimately, after the project's finished, every cell will be colored either red, green, or yellow, in order to see, okay, this, for instance, is a don't. This, our analytics tool, has in this particular dimension the don't option, Maybe as a leader, I can involve into the design process of this solution in order to have, in this particular case, the no opt-out option that employees, for instance, cannot opt out to an opt-in option or certainly to an opt-out option. This is the first what we did, having this 11 design parameters for people analytics tools in organizations. And you can depict all the tools in such a configuration of various cells from the bottom to the top. Those, yeah. Those categories, uh, Pardon me? Do they define the context? I mean, first category, second category, third category, those are different contexts? No, these are not different contexts. So these are the 11 design parameters. And each design parameter can have two to six specifying categories. Just to give you an example, so one is the possibility for employees to opt out. This is a relevant design dimension for analytics solutions, right? And this can have three different forms. Either people can opt in voluntarily, either they can opt out or they don't have the chance to opt out, for instance. Or in terms of transparency, do they know what's going on with analytics? Do they have, uh, does the, the, the system reveal full disclosure? Yes. Is it no disclosure? Or is it what the uh, surveillance guys will call a function creep? I have a rough idea but I don't really know it. <laughs> and I don't, need, I don't really know what's also in it, right? Exactly, and the funny thing about this is, or the cool thing, at least from my perspective, is that this entire framework does not only capture the status quo right now, but given that this is the ultimate spectrum of these 11 dimensions and specifying elements, we can also depict what's about to come. So we can also depict what will come or how we prospectively should design analytics tools which are not invented yet in order to be, for instance, trust promoting or at least not trust hindering. 
We also did a survey in Switzerland on the maturity level of people analytics. I don't want to bore you with all these stats, but again, two things stand out, at least from my perspective. The majority, so these are these five circles are the steps of the employee life cycle, more or less, in terms of application where AI and ML algorithms may involve. The biggest portion falls into the resent, uh, retention and transition management. And for those who can read it, these are all old technologies. So let's say engagement surveys, 56% out of these say, okay, we do engagement surveys as part of our analytics program, which is nothing else than having an online engagement survey online and not analog paper-based, right? Or 360 degree feedback tools or entry exit, exit service. So the first thing is, at least for Switzerland, it applies that we can to some extent demystify the hysteria about robot is stealing our jobs. Because what we largely see is old data reinvented or maybe reanalyzed with novel technologies, but not that robots are stealing our jobs or we're fired by robot as we've recently learned from Neue Zürich Zeitung in the Zalando case, right? But, and this is the interesting thing when we, for instance, talk about compliance management, and of course, these data stems from more or less highly regulated industries, such as banking, insurance, finance, etc. that we have screening of emails and calls, 13% as the top scorer out of these 18%. This is reading between the lines. This is AI-based compliance management. Does, com does finance guy write an email to the, um, I have no idea, compliance guy, hey, my beloved dear, which might contradict any compliance norm or something like that, right? And this is also pretty new that we have, for instance, CCTV monitoring in order to improve workflows as an application or smart collaboration software, internet of things that chairs know if somebody is sitting on it or measuring the CO2 concentration in shared offices to infer the productivity, for instance where the assumption is the more CO2, the more people, the more sweaty, the more productivity. This is something which struck me during the analysis and I just want you to put out a piece of paper and write down your thoughts and your comments on this. Uh, what we asked here is the leaders. This is all self-assessment of leaders. We asked them how, or, or please assess your technological affinity saying how well do you relate with novel technologies and their use, do you have so easy solutions for problems arising with technology, and we ask them at the same time how well do you engage in tailoring the solutions you implement. Do you buy these products off the shelf or do you engage in customizing it? And interestingly, it doesn't matter if leaders self-assess themselves as either being highly technological affinity or not, they do not engage at all. They buy the off-the-shelf solutions. And this is why I put it, imagine it's analytics and leadership is not going, borrowed from the famous quote of Bert Brecht. Another one which also struck me most, we were talking about people or self-assessment of leaders in terms of their moral awareness. Asking them, are you aware of ethical issues arising due to the implementation of AI in the workplace? high or low, basically. And we asked them, how many internal stakeholders do you involve in the implementation and purchase decision process? And what we see is, in terms of purchase decisions, many employees, uh, sorry, many stakeholders are involved, more or less regardless whether moral awareness is high or low, but in terms of the implementation in the workplace, there is this is low stakeholder involvement in the implementation process, regardless of whether they know the ethical dilemmas arising or not. And hard, there's hardly any dialogue going on. So this is why I labeled this, what I don't know won't hurt me, question mark. So write down your thoughts. We'll come to this in the very end of the wrap up, and then we'll discuss this further. So I think I'll skip that for the sake of time. I've more or less covered this as well. And this I've said as well. So, and now we took the chance to say, okay, now we have, we know what are we talking about. We're on the same page in terms of people analytics. We have a certain understanding of what's going on in the Swiss market and the Swiss, in Swiss organizations. And what we did now is we selected companies in order to do case studies to learn from and explore how does the workplace look like.
in order to understand processes, to ultimately color all the cells from the framework, right, in order to see what are the do's and don'ts in order to foster or promote corporate trust. And this is what we did. And I have some preliminary results from the case study, which we would call from science as a deviant case, i.e. a company where the analytics maturity is very high, where the workplace is heavily penetrated with technology, but, and this is interesting, where tr employees trust in the employer is very high at the same time. And we chose this company in order to understand or to learn from anomalies in order to transfer this knowledge, for instance, to extreme cases or to typical cases. Deviance is assessed because this counter counteracts somehow what we believe as a baseline assumption that the greater the analytics, the less the trust, right? So, and this, these are the two most tr striking results, that datafication technologies automate control, so automate the complete cycle of HR management techniques, and given this, automation also requires reorganization in the workplace. Do I have some time? This is the last slide. It says that datafication, as I said, okay, this does not work. Datafication technology automate control. For instance, technology does goal setting, monitoring, feedback evaluation, and rewarding and sanctioning without humans. Where we have believed that, for instance, data was used in order to inform the leadership decision or the leadership task. Now we find all these management controlled practices to be fully automated and leaders do not have to involve at all. And secondly, what I've said, automation requires reorganization that given this being in place, datafication technologies emerge as novel actors of flesh and blood from the perception of the actors involved in the workplace. So we're talking about robots as colleagues and robots as bosses. And it changes the work relationships which have been thought of being proper so far. To be a little more precise, we're talking about novel colleagues, which is hierarchically on the same floor, on, on, uh, sorry, on eye level, and with whom humans have to interact with in order to accomplish predefined goals and, and work packages, right? And we perceive them, they are also perceived as novel leaders, such that an algorithm gives a directive, hierarchically superior, and people have to follow what has been what has been um, set out as a directive, for instance. And this is something which really struck me during the analysis that datafication technologies act as relationship changers, vigilant and watchful relationship between tech and humans. This means that humans believe themselves as being the extended arm of the machine. So that there's analysis going on and going on and going on, for instance, these kind of things over there, and people have to be watchful and vigilant that the analysis go correct and that various technologies analysis interact smoothly and error free in order to make the outcome, in order to complete the work package, in order to secure the workflow smoothly, for instance. And finally, humans have to take the wrap, which somehow relates to the dark side of this entire AI involvement in the workplace that says, even if the analysis done by a computer or an algorithm leads to a wrong or misleading result, humans are responsible for that. Humans have to take the rap, regardless of who's made the analysis, how precise this was, et cetera, et cetera. Humans have to take the rap. Also because, at least from my perspective, there's no legal framework in order to assign, for instance, jurisdiction liabilities to algorithms or to non-human to non actors. These are the implications for leadership. I just want to highlight some, for instance, leaders should be aware of the illusion of control. This means the sweet poison of tech, right? Be conscious about backfiring effects. It's not all good about the implementation of AI as we have seen, right? Second, and this relates to what John has said earlier, tech design features. You can also have trust promoting design features in your AI solution, as we have seen in, the, seen in the framework previously, right? For instance, if you grant people the opportunity to opt in voluntarily in order just here it is, if you don't want it, opt out, makes a difference. Or this is what we know from, from control back in the days, enabling autonomy, granting 
design options versus autonomy or self-determinism constraining design options. And finally, and this is somehow philosophically, the question is who controls whom in the very end of the day? And this relates to what Marisa said at the very beginning, automation of leadership. When we're talking about leadership as the one who has the knowledge about the entire work, pro work process and tries to secure each step in order to produce the outcome, what if this entire process is done by an algorithm and the one who is responsible has no idea how this observation was coming about, but has at best to implement it when we're not talking about hiring and firing by algorithm. So basically who is controlling whom? Is the algorithm controlling the human leader or is the human leader controlling the algorithm? This is something I want to throw in as food for thought, maybe also for the coffee break. And I think that's it. Thanks for your attention. I'm looking very much forward to the discussion. And later on, this is the tiny little teaser for the very end. We'll have a mentee where you can all put your questions and buzzwords and hot topics and current needs in, which serve as an avenue for future engagement and action. Thanks a lot. <laughs>